how do you say, not a Facebook, I don't have Facebook, but I have an email uh, composite of operators and we share a lot of information together and uh, it's really valuable because I can learn what they have learned and anytime you do have a problem, share phone numbers. Y'all might be working for different groups, but share phone numbers, emails, Facebooks if you have it, and that way you can <coughs> communicate with each other. If you ever run into a specific problem that you cannot resolve, you might be able to get that answer from one of your buddies out there that uh, might have experienced it in the past. And uh, one thing about the books, if you notice, we call them modules rather than chapters. And A&M, being a military type school, it uses military form of producing manuals. And normally you have a terminal objective and an enabling objective, and I like it. But they start off with zero, module zero, which is sort of the introduction. And then each module after that is a specific subject and I only can tell you this, when you're studying and you're preparing, like this gentleman was talking about people taking exams, is to get yourself a spiral notebook. And on the left-hand side, write down the subject, like disinfection. And then put down who, what, when, where, why, and how. Okay? Who can disinfect the water? Who must disinfect the water? How can we disinfect the water? What type of chemicals can we use? All of those different types of things that we put down. And then on the right-hand side of your manual, you can write down how this pertains to your specific system. And I've uh, had quite good uh, success doing that, okay? And so ask those questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? And how do we disinfect? Why do we disinfect? and all of that. And then ask yourself, is it a action or non-action type question? You know, non-action be like, what is the federal agency responsible for environmental law in the U.S.? And we know that is the U.S. EPA or the EPA. What is the state organization responsible for environmental law? And things like that. Those are more like nouns. But an action is where there's like a verb. Something is taking place. Something is happening. Like when we mix chlorine with water, there is a chemical reaction. And we form those two acids, hypochlorous and hydrochloric acid. So there's an action. Then ask yourself, is it singular or plural? Okay, singular. Like, what can we use for disinfection? Well, there's... That's a plural question. We can use chemicals. We can use ultraviolet light. We can use chlorine. We can use bleach. We can use calcium hypochlorite, or HTH as they call it. Many, many different answers, okay? You can actually use natural processes if you wish. A lot of people are going to natural processes where they're actually using a biological uh, bacterial to remove the organics from the water. And it works quite well if it's controlled right. So those really help. And then, like in Texas, right now, we can only use one product for disinfection. So when they talk about terminal or final disinfection in Texas, we still can only use chlorine. Some states allow you to use UV and other, pro pro uh, other oxidants besides just chlorine. And uh, the reason we use chlorine in Texas is, uh, how do you say, uh, we have some conditions down there that are much different than here in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or any place else. We have a lot of Giardia lamblia in the soil. So if we have a broken main, we can get Giardia into the, into the system. And so we have to, we have to uh, disinfect for that type of critter. And uh, y'all might not have that problem up here where it's colder like today, and uh, so we, you might not have to be under the same scrutiny as Texas would be, and there's nothing wrong with that. Each state is different, and the EPA realizes that. But you'll notice, like in Module 16, that if you turn to Module 16, that's the one we're gonna look at. We're gonna have a terminal objective, like in, um, 
in the military, we're going to be taking out this target. And then the enabling objective or the necessary things that we have to have in place for it to be successful. So I really like the way the books, being military and uh, from the old school, uh, how do you say, I like it. So let's look at the terminal objective right here. And let me get my little puncher out. Just how do you say we, we want to keep up? All right. Upon the successful completion of this module, again, you and I as an operator will be able to summarize the process of the disinfection of the water. And you know, we always talk about the, the water plant. It could be a groundwater system. It could be a surface water system. It could be conventional. You might even be using microfiltration, ultra, nano, or even RO. But the most important thing that we do as an operator is disinfection, right? And so we look at it as a very important part of what we do. And then the enabling objectives. Let me flip this little thing here again. We want to be able to outline the processes related to the micro microbiological quality of the water. So we're going to talk about quality in relation to back tea. What types of bacteriological contaminants can be out there. Discuss the various facets of chlorination and then give examples of alternative disinfectants. And again, that could be ozone, UV, or even natural processes. And there is other oxidants, you know, besides chlorine. You can use potassium permanganate. You can use iodine and bromine and all the other ones. But why do we use chlorine? Because it's the one that produces the least amount of adverse effects on the water, the quality of the water. So we'll look at those and go from there. And uh, if there's ever any questions, and I always tell Miss Bessie over there that anytime she wants to add something, jump right in because let me tell you something. This, and, and that includes the class. There is no one in here that knows everything. And like I said, the best source of information is fellow operators. So if you have something that you have learned, please share it with us because that way I learn, Bessie learns, and everybody else does too. So add to it as we go, okay? And uh, the first part, waterborne diseases. And uh, disinfection destroys pathogens, okay? Does it kill all the pathogens? Yes or no? No. Will, if we were using chlorination, will chlorination even remove cryptosporidiosis or cryptosporidium from the water? Yeah, the only way is filtration, correct. And chlorine really has very little or no effect on crypto. So we have to look at it from there, okay? Sterilization kills all organisms. They have learned recently that's not true. Uh, they have found some pathogens that are not waterborne, that are bloodborne diseases that can go into 500 degrees Celsius and survive. They have such a, they have a outer layer of protein that is so dense that it's, it takes a long time for it to actually disintegrate or burn up. And uh, they discovered it actually in the ocean and where it exists. So we look at it. Sterilization is not always necessary. Uh, there's one exception. Our back tea bottles, are those sterilized when we collect our sample, our sample bottles? Yeah. Yes, those are sterilized. And so the reason those are sterilized, if they were contaminated and we put a clean sample in there, we could get what, a false positive, right? And so we want to treat those little bottles with real care. And the reason is, if we accidentally contaminate it, uh, it's best that a person who's collecting the samples does it early in the morning when they're clean, they wash their hands, and they shouldn't be sick. If they've got the flu or they've got the, the bug of some sort, they could accidentally contaminate your sample. And so we look at it from there, okay? And uh, most microorganisms in water are non-pathogenic. Is fecal pathogenic? 
human or, human or animal waste, is it actually dangerous? The answer would be no, as long as that person is not sick. But if that person is sick, pathogens will be found in the fecal or the human or animal waste. And that's why we have to be so careful because you never know when you might have the bug, you know, a virus or a flu or something like that, and we could pass it on to somebody else. So we look at it. Intestinal waste contamination transmits pathogens. And that's the, the truth of it, is that when a person is sick, then the fecal matter will contain pathogens and it can be passed on to other people or other folks out there that might be uh, in contact with that person. Any questions on that? Okay. Diseases transmitted by unsafe water. And there's not that many, believe it or not, not compared to blood diseases. Blood diseases, there's a lot of viruses and things out there that can be transmitted. And, uh, but in water, there's a few that we have to be concerned with. And that's typhoid and paratyphoid. And both, most of those are protozoan, okay, of, of site, of type. And uh, dysentery, and you can have a mimic dysentery, which is also a protozoan. Or you can have gastroenteritis that's more bacterial uh, type of dysentery. And then hepatitis A. Uh, hepatitis B is, is what, bloodborne? But hepatitis A is quite common. There is no cures for viruses, none whatsoever. And so if you get a virus, the only thing you can do is control the environment. You have to control, if you remember Magic Johnson, Magic Johnson has HIV virus, but he controls his diet, he controls the environment, which keeps it dormant. But if he should neglect himself, he could what? break out with full-blown AIDS, and that could be deadly. And of course, hepatitis C, same thing. As long as we control the environment, we can live fairly comfortably. But if we neglect that environment, then they can come out of dormancy and cause you quite, uh, we lost one of our instructors to hepatitis C. He got it when he accidentally was working in a laboratory and scratched himself and, uh, and acquired hepatitis C. And it was, came from the blood that they were doing. And if you get tattoos, people love to get tattoos. Uh, make sure the place you go to is following proper sterilization because if they're tattooing other people and they get those people's blood on their needles, you can actually pick up the hepatitis C. That's how it's normally transmitted now. Or if they're drug dealers and they're druggies, then they can get it from contaminated needles from other people. So those are one though, gastroenteritis. And like I said, there's several different kinds, you know, viruses, you're bacterial, and they're quite uh, readily around. You know, if you get the flu or, uh, or if you get a virus type, you know, some people think they have the flu and really they have a virus. When you have the flu, you're gonna run extreme temperature. You, do you know what the difference between a virus and bacterial? Viruses do not have a reproductive system. They enter the cell, they go in, they use the reproductive system of that cell to reproduce more viruses, killing the cell. That's why there's no cure for them. They migrate from cell to cell, but they also can live a long time if the environment is perfect. But chlorination just wipes them out. They're very easily oxidized. Now, bacteria produce toxins. The toxic material is what causes you and I to become ill. Does that make sense? So that's what we look at. Viruses need the reproductive system of that cell to reproduce. They do not have any reproductive organs at all. So they use your DNA, RNA, and to reproduce and stuff like that. And cholera, which is pretty much eliminated. Uh, I, I really feel bad about folks today. A lot of people don't believe in vaccination, vaccinating their children. But let me tell you, they think that the vaccinations are worse 
I am at the age, I'm in my 60s, I'm 64 years old, and how do you say, when I was going through first grade, second grade, we used to lose two or three kids a year. And because of the fact that we didn't have any inoculations for those diseases. I was 14 years old when they first came out with polio. I had six people in my first grade class that came out with polio, not knowing that it was a waterborne disease, believe it or not. And uh, so I experienced growing up death and uh, with children, you know, people that were six, seven years old until I was about 12, 13 years old and they finally came out with the polio vaccine and then they came out with measles and chicken pox, whatever you can get, you know, all those good things. So uh, get your children vaccinated and plus yourselves too. And then many, many others. And, uh, and that's important. Now when we talk about indicator organisms, if you look on page 16-3, and I like what it says in here. Look at the second paragraph, and I don't like reading, but I like what it says. Whoever wrote that paragraph did pretty good. The total coliform group of bacteria are the indicator microorganisms. Their group includes non-fecal and fecal coliform. So it's both what? Non-fecal? and also fecal coliform. Generally, these bacteria do not cause illness. Non-fecal coliform primarily live in soil. Fecal coliform live in the intestines, or in the intestines of humans and warm-blooded critters. E. coli, Escherichia, fecal coliforms are the most specific indicator of intestinal contamination. And that is a very important paragraph. I would highlight it because in most states, when they give examinations, they're going to talk about indicator microorganisms. And that's where we have to start from, okay? Pathogens difficult to detect. Some of the analytical methods for detecting pathogens, individual pathogens. Give an example. Cryptosporidiosis or cryptosporidium. You have to run a large volume of water through a filter small enough that the cryptosporidium are entrapped in the filter. Then you have to take that filter, dry it, and then you have to stain it, and then you have to put it under the microscope. And you look for what? Individual crypto. And it's quite a expensive process. If you had to pay for something like that, uh, it might have to, uh, you know, the local citizens might get awfully disturbed at having to pay a high water rate. So we use other methods to determine their possible presence. And that's by using the coliform group. The coliform group indicate that there might be something there. If you find what, coliform? then there is a possibility that there is what? A pathogen. Does that mean that there is one? No, but there is a possibility, okay? Samples tested for fecal contamination. Okay, fecal is better than just E. coli. Fecal is checking for what? Intestinal coliform groups. If those are present, there is a what? A greater possibility that there could be a pathogen in that sample. Because if that person or that warm-blooded critter had a virus or a flu bug in him, he could pass it on to who? The next person. So fecal is a better indicator. And I understand, I don't know, Bessie might be able to add to this. When I was up at Region 3, up in Dallas, at the EPA conference, they're wanting to go to three samples. They want to do E. coli, Escherichia, and also fecal. Yes. And can you imagine collecting three samples? Now, here's what I asked them. I was talking to the head honcho up there. 
And I asked him, I said, well, what if the coliform comes back negative and the excursoritia comes back negative, but the fecal comes back positive? And I said, what is that an indicator of? He said, sloppy collecting. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a very good answer. He said, no, if that happens, you're going to have to retest. And that gets more, what, more expense, you know. I don't know what y'all pay for your all's testing up here, but back home right now, it's running anywhere from 20 to about $30, depending on which laboratory you take it to. Y'all know what it costs y'all here in, in y'all's communities? That's about right. Somewhere in that range? Yeah, when you start, like when you just said, you start selling them for 20 months, you have to take the, the, the chance that someone's going to, like I take thousands a year. Yes, sir. And I, I screw up on it too. Oh, yeah. You know? Right. So by the time you, you got two samples, I got seven wells running, that's 14, plus, that's like 20 plus samples, I got two positives. Yes. So I mean, it adds up an hour. And, and it, it can get quite expensive. And it, it's scary. But I, right now our politicians are divided on how much is re, what we consider reasonable. I still like the old coliform. Uh, we have to be, what, sort of prudent with people's money. And coliform does a good job because it's testing both for what? Fecal and non-fecal. So it does well. What do you think, Miss Bessie? Well, with the new regs, regardless of what we say, yeah. <laughs> um, they are looking at the more specific, the fecal, the E. coliform. And even as far as reporting goes, um, one of the thing is they're doing away with the reporting for the total coliform because they're looking at these specifics only. And as you say, when you have those positive, not only does that mean the distribution upstream, downstream, but we're going back to each source now and you have to do all of that right. in addition. So I guess the next phase in 2016, you really you don't have to report those total. The total. But they want you to identify That's what's right. causing it. That which you no know, well is is, is open to a whole new can of worms. Yep. I mean that costs a lot of money mm -hmm. and time. That's the biggest catch. There's, uh, and uh, I believe in doing everything humanly possible within reason. So, but only the elected officials can make those choices, and we go from there. Well, unfortunately, you have to the uh, people who aren't in the in the industry making the rules. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why we need to put in input. Yes, sir. All right. Indicator organisms, totaliform, coliform uh, group, and uh, total meaning both what non-intestinal and intestinal uh, testing. Okay. E. coli, the most specific indicator, and uh, fecal coliform indicates intestinal waste, and I should have been punching the button as I was going, so we'll go from there. And the increased risk of disease. And anytime you have, you know, if you go from a coliform to fecal, then there is gonna be what? An increase in the possibility of disease. So we have to be very careful and do our testing thoroughly. And uh, and I think that's the most difficult thing because I always tell the operators that I worked with that if you even suspected that you contaminated one of those test uh, sample bottles, throw it away, get a new one. You don't want to get a false positive because you, you, you did something wrong in your sampling. You know, you might have accidentally did something that can, could have contaminated, sneezed on it, accidentally you know, uh, add a little uh, uh, aerosol there, you know, and so we go. So those are the things that we look at, okay? And then sampling, important operator responsibility. And, and that's what we just talked about. Personal hygiene is very, very important when you're collecting samples. It should be an operator who is very aware of all of the negative aspects of collecting a sample. You don't want to take somebody freshly off the street that you just hired, just got his basic license, and he's out there collecting samples. 
he might not be aware of all of the problems associated with sampling. I always personally believed in collecting the samples early in the month, early in the week, so that if I had to retest, I had plenty of time, but do it when you're not having been working for a long period of time. Your clothes are clean and everything else. Uh, when you go to the faucets, whatever faucets you're using, I don't know if y'all have your own or if you use customer faucets or what, but wash your hands real thoroughly and, uh, and uh, make sure you handle the bottles correctly. And AWWA has a real good training film on proper technique. And uh, those, you can get that through the American Water Works Association. And it's a good training film for all of your operators, new operators, that they, it's about a 17, 20 minute film and it shows you proper technique. Do you have that one, Miss Bessie? I don't. Yeah, I'll have to give it to you. I have it in my computer, so. Yeah, and, uh, and it's a real good film on how to collect back tea samples. And so we'll, we'll go from there. And uh, so how to collect the samples, okay? And uh, determine the number of samples required. Now that's based on what? Is it based on population, connections, or what? Population. Can it require more than what's in the uh, required numbers that are in the population? Can it be more than that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, do you? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And how many of you have seen your water, uh, your monitoring plan? Are y'all aware of your monitoring plan that the EPA requires us to have? The, uh, anyway, in your monitoring plan, and if you can see over here, I really like this board. We have the regular old dry eraser boards, and uh, this works so much better. You know, the other ones get all dirty. But first of all, let's say we just have a groundwater well. So we're gonna have a well, and then I'm coming in, let's say that I'm going to have a uh, ground storage tank over here. And let's say that Maybe I have, do y'all have any other problems besides, do y'all have iron in the water or something like that? Do y'all use any polyorthophosphate or sodium hex or something like that? Well, you know, you're, if you're using something like uh, a poly, okay, then you're going to show the injection point for poly. Anytime you're using something, especially with groundwater, you want to apply that chemical first. Because if you use chlorine first, you're gonna have high demand on the chlorine. And thusly, if you add the poly after, it's not gonna have any effect on that water. It's just waste of chemical. So you would always wanna add your first. And then let's say we're going in with disinfection. So let's say that we're using chlorine and we're only using free, okay? So free chlorine, we show that injection point, okay? And then it goes into the ground storage. And let's say we just have a pressure tank. So we have a pressure tank. We're gonna show this. We're gonna show our injection points. And then we're also gonna show where we collect our raw water samples. So if I'm on a well, I might have my raw water sample tap right here, okay? This is all gonna be in your monitoring plan. Now, when we go into the distribution system, Let's say that I'm coming from that system and I'm going out here and I got this loop, okay? This is my water line, this loop. It's a real small community. Maybe it's like a mobile home park or something like that. And I've got my houses in here. Let's say I got houses on the outside too, okay? We got something like this. And let's say I've got some houses out here. And, uh, and let's say I've got from my water line, let's say I come in here and uh, this is my water line. And let's say I've got a connection going here to here and then one from here to there and then one from here to there, one from here to there and then one to here to there and then I got one little line over here and I mean one line to here 
And then I come over here and let's say, I drew that one too far. I come over here and then I got one over here to these two, one to here and there. So let's say this is lot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 11, 12. No, that's, this is one, isn't it? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, okay? So let's just say that A represents chlorine, B represents back T sample, and C represents disinfection byproducts, okay? Now, A, let's say that I have to do one sample per week. Okay, so I start off in January, February, March, and let's say I have four weeks, or five weeks in January, four weeks in February, and maybe five weeks in, in March, okay? So I'm gonna pick out, let's say I only have to do one back T sample per month, okay? Well, I still have to have what? Five sample sites, right? So I'm going to have like, maybe I'll collect one here, B, and a B, and a B, and let's, let's put a B here, and maybe a B here. But then I'm going to need an alternate site, just in case something goes wrong. So we'll put like an alternate B, and an alternate B, all right? And let's say that I collect a chlorine sample once per week. So in January, I'm gonna to have to have, and we're gonna put, wherever we have a bacteria, we're gonna always have to have a what? Chlorine, and uh, this alternate, and this is be an alternate A, and A, and uh, A, and all my sites, okay? Now, my disinfection byproducts has to be at the furthest extents of my system. So I'm gonna have a C right here at, at number five, okay? Site number five. Now, January, let's say the first week, I collect one at uh, B3, and I also collect chlorine there, okay? Then the next week, I'm going to rotate between my, my A's, collecting my chlorine examples, and I'm going to keep on going in a big circle, in a big loop, every time. But when it comes to February, I've got to collect that back T sample again. I cannot go back to this one. I'm going to rotate it maybe to 5B, plus I'm going to collect my chlorine sample there. All right? And you rotate around, but I always collect my what? My disinfection byproduct at where? At number five, at the furthest extents. Have you ever seen y'all's monitoring plan for your facilities? You've seen it? Oh, yeah. One. Wonderful, good. And some, you might not be in charge of that program, but that is one of the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act is setting up the monitoring plan and, and it really helps to have that program. You wanna to add to that, Miss Bissy? Oh, pretty close, okay. So we gonna have a sampling plan and in that sampling plan, we're gonna designate the sites and all of those things, okay? Now here's the problem. If I go to that site and my chlorine residual is less than minimum, do I collect a back T sample there? I can see uh, what's causing it. What's the not the chlorine? You want to know. For some reason, you don't. You go to one of your alternate sites. They're going to want to why you have a, a problem there. But they, the probability of it coming back a false positive is too great. So they want you to go to one of your alternate sites. But then you want to flush that area because is chlorine ever really supposed to be below minimum? No. Does it happen occasionally? Yes. And a, a system should have in place a operating procedure for preventing that from happening like there's a lot of towns that have large distribution systems, but very few customers. And chlorine is very difficult to maintain. So they have to go out there about once a week and flush 
that main to keep that chlorine at or above minimums. And uh, they don't allow it to go below the mini uh, minimum, but they, they go out there about once a week or sometimes even more often just to flush the system to keep the chlorine in for that system. See, that's where Rhode Island, I think, can make the lag behind because we're, we're at Lisboa, we're envelope. We're not mandated to maintain a, a, a minimum position. Right. Yeah. And that's where the lag is. Um, and that's where the lag is. Yeah, they don't have to. They don't have to. Yeah. If they can get that variance, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's, it's hard to get, but if you get it, take advantage of it. Yeah. All right. And community water systems, uh, select representative sites. When we talk about sites, we have to look at everything. We have to look at where population is. Do we have multiple zones within the system? Do we have a high level zone? Do we have a low level zone? If I'm using more than one source, where do I have deteriorating lines? Where do I have m the most difficult maintaining uh, chlorine residuals? Those are the things that we have to look at when we choose those sites. But all sites must be active, okay? No matter what. And uh, they must be active sites. I am in the firm believer in putting in my own sample sites. When you use residential homes, do y'all use homes or do y'all use uh, your own test sites? Is pretty, any, pretty much businesses in public areas. Public areas? Easy access. Yes, sir. Uh, I know we have some homes in ours. In homes? Yeah. Yes. And, and that's fine if you know the people. And, uh, but I, I prefer, if I can't afford it, to put in my own samples uh, sites. That way I don't have to worry about customers doing things with their plumbing that might not work well for our sampling. A lot of times a residential home will put maybe a water softener in or something like that, and you're not aware of it. <laughs> and uh, something's different about your, their system that, that we don't know. So that's a possibility. Okay, so must be representative of your site. Deteriorating lines, where you have a lot of water breaks, the size of mains, population, do you have different pressure zones, all those things must be taken into consideration. Uh, various size mains, what types, what materials are they made out? Are they ductile or cast iron? Are they, like in our area, we use a lot of PVC and high density polyethylene now that they, uh, they've become available, so we use a lot of that. Uh, five sample sites or less, you still must have what? Five sites. And then you want some alternate sites too. Even though it only says five sites, if one of those sites should come back uh, something wrong, then you need an alternate site in your monitoring plan so that you can collect that site. Uh, descript give descriptive address and it can be a combination of letters and numbers. Okay, and make sites easily noted and explainable. That way, if the state or the local representatives go out, they can easily find the site without you being there. Uh, you, most people have a site map with all of those designated addresses and showing where they are on that system. And I have a question, Jack. Yes. Neil pointed out earlier that they collect additional samples in order to meet the 5% or to make sure that you're well over that. The question is, when I collect these additional samples, do I have to report them? Absolutely. Like, I'm required, I'm required to um, get 20 a month. We collect, I take, I have 11 sites a week, I have 844. So I can get, I can get two hits. As long as my repeats are all absent, I'm not in violation. But uh, everything you take, Every sample you take, because what well, we could they um, consider uh, routine originals. If, if you sample it, you have to report with the results. Unless it's like a new water main extension that's that you know, you know, you're check checking to see if it's the same in the past, so you can make it part of your system. You don't have to report that as that's exempt, you know, but you have to still show that it passed before you put it into, into service. 
Wonderful. Yes. The, a lot of people, when they go out to do their chlorine testing, if you use a unapproved method, say I go out there with a color comparator, is that reportable? You know the little wheel with the colored, have y'all ever seen those? Is that? Yeah, yeah, whatever they call it. If, it's an, if it is not an EPA approved method or a state approved method, Texas, we have several methods that we use from standard methods and several that we use from EPA. Both are acceptable in Texas. But each state has prescribed instruments and methods that they can use. So you need to be aware of your state's requirements plus the EPA. But if you use an approved method, you must report it. The, uh, and, uh, the company I work for, they, 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 they're really hell-bent on compliance now. And oh, yes. They, they've been jamming it down our throats like you would. But a lot of it's come to light. I mean, if, um, like in my situation, I'm not doing a whole lot of virus removal uh, for chlorination. So I, I can skirt a lot of the requirements, but if you do the fall out where you constantly maintain, um, constantly uh, recording your chlorine residuals, that basically prevents you from having to um, sample your source water. Should a wholesaler come up with a positive, you won't have to sample your well because you can prove we had a state specified residual we were maintaining. But now when you're doing that, yeah, you can calibrate the instrumentation, but you have to be using uh, the things you use to calibrate your instrument, they have to be approved also. Mm -hmm. you, you know, like, uh, yeah. like for me, I, I can use secondary standards like the gel, the gel mm -hmm. caps, mm -hmm. and just to make sure my my, DP, my uh, colorimeter is working, you know, is, is within specs. Right. But if I was if I was um, doing four log virus removal, I would have to use the actual ampules. The, yeah, the standards. The standards. Mm -hmm. And then every week before I went out and did my bat keys, because I have yeah. to make sure that instrument was within yeah. the specs, the Right. And each state is different. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, it's, you got it. Any time you use it for any kind of um, sampling in the system, yes. it's got to be The calories right. got to check. Now, Bessie might help me on this. In Texas, we're required to do standards once every 30 days. And then we can do jails on secondary standards every day. Right. But uh, we must run standards at least once a month. And, uh, uh, and that's when you also have to do percent recovery, percent, de percent deviation, and standard deviation. Yeah, and it's 10% like in Texas. Yeah. Now, each state is a little different, right? Mm -hmm. Each state is a little different. So you have to understand what your state requirements are. They can supersede EPA requirements. They can never be less than EPA. They can be, they can be yeah. more. And I don't think the EPA even has a standard, do they? As far as, there, there are some guidelines. Guidelines, yes. Yeah. Guidelines, but really, they leave it up to each state to make that determination. Yes, sir. That's a good question. You know, good things, too. Oh, yes, yes. In Texas, pH must be seven or greater yeah, at all times. Can't because of lead, you know, the old lead stuff, yeah. All right. Uh, required site listing information, of course, uh, if you have a detailed uh, distribution system where you can show all those sites and addresses where any person who with reasonable knowledge of the community or not any reasonable knowledge of the community can find that location. And like when we were finding this place yesterday, she pulled out GPS, wonderful tool, and uh, typed in y'all's address here and it took us right here. And uh, so we came over here yesterday just to make sure we were coming to the right place. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful with GPS nowadays? You can, except when it's maybe two addresses of the same and they send you to the opposite ends of the world. That's happened too. Okay. Non-community system procedures, maximum daily population for required samples, and uh, and that's, you know, unique to, do we have any non-community system operators in here? Non-community? Anybody operate an RV park, a recreational vehicle park, any, any of those? 
How about industry? Anybody in industry? Uh, that's good. Okay. Uh, businesses select one point representing the plumbing, and that's real critical. If you had a large distribution system in a, say it was like a Walmart or some food processing system, you've got to be very careful in a non-community system like that because a lot of their sites are, what, unacceptable because they're continuously being contaminated. If you go to a meat processing system uh, that has a large system, but most of their sites are contaminated, they have to be very careful collecting samples because of the fact that, you know, handling all that animal beef and stuff like that and chickens and all that other stuff, pork and things like this. So it must be representative of that plumbing also. And recreational areas develop plans as a community. Um, do y'all have quite a few state parks, uh, federal parks up here in, in this area? Not so much around, but you get further north into New Hampshire, Vermont, and that's where they have more, mm -hmm. but small. Yeah, 10-4. We, we have a few parks in that, but nothing. 10-4. Locate sites on distribution maps. Again, that's pretty good. List sites as wood community systems. Just the same way. You need what? If you have a large recreational system, like where I live, we have two state parks and one federal park that I go to quite, or two federal parks I go to. One of them is Fort Davis out in the uh, mountainous area, and the other one is Big Ben. I like the mountain trek and going up in those mountains, and there's sometimes as much as two or 3,000 people there at any one time. Uh, several of the state parks I go to is like Lost Maples and places like that where you actually stay. They have uh, a little uh, like motel rooms there uh, and you stay there and you can have a great time. And, but they have monitoring plans. They have different structures and so they have sites just like you would in a community. They have designated sites that they rotate between. And so it's, it's really not a community system, but it's nearly the same. Okay, but not quite. And uh, so we have, and then how to collect samples. And uh, in your book, if we look in the book right quick, starting over here on page uh, 16.4. And again, uh, you can look at this. And, and it's normally based on population. It can actually be more, more than, than that. Uh, I've been in several communities that I work for that we had to collect, um, uh, it was almost 20% more additional samples because of the uniqueness of the system. The, writ the written sampling site, and then we talked about the obtaining the sample containers. Most of the time, the laboratories will provide that for you. And normally, they are a 125 mil sample bottle that has the 100 mil mark located on that sample bottle. Okay, the main thing is that when you collect the sample, inside of that bottom is a 10.1 uh, of 10% sodium thiosulfate. Okay, 0.1 mil of 10% sodium thiosulfate, which is going to neutralize the chlorine in that sample, if it's in reasonable amount of chlorine. So you don't want to, if it's a tablet type, how many of y'all have had the bottles with the tablet in them? Y'all have those? Some have the powder on the inside. And I like the ones uh, with either the tablet or the powder. It doesn't make any difference. But make sure you don't pour out the, rinse it out or anything like that because then you, you're not going to have any sodium thiosulfate in there to neutralize the chlorine. So basically, if you remember, we're gonna turn on the faucet Normally they say turn it on at near wide open, okay? And the reason is you don't want it wide open because if it is a globe type valve, you could mess up the, the, the valve itself. So open it and then close it a little bit so that you don't mess up the stem of the valve and allow it to run. And then take your, either you can use a thermometer or your finger and normally when the water temperature changes, that's when you're getting water 
from the distribution system itself, okay? And I like to use a thermometer a lot of times because I just want to see how hot the water is. Uh, uh, where we, where Bessie and I work out of College Station, Brian, the water coming out of the ground is 140 degrees. You take a bath in it and scald yourself. Uh, the water is extremely hot, so we have to run it through cooling towers. During the summertime, they turn off the water heaters, and there goes. And trying to get a cold drink of water, impossible. So uh, we have to cool that water, and uh, it's 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 something else. But uh, normally when the temperature change, you're getting water from the distribution system. And, uh, and uh, then you normally would check the chlorine, okay? Uh, check the chlorine in the water. And it, in Texas, if it's less than minimum, then we're gonna continue to let the service line run until we do get a residual. But here's the thing. If I run that sample using the EPA or a Texas approved method, then I have to report it. So what I do, I use a paper cup, put some water in there, drop the DPD in there, and if I get a nice pinky color, I know I got a chlorine residual. Is that reportable? No. So you can use a color comparator or a paper cup, something cheap. Drop your pills in there and, and uh, Make sure you got a good residual, and then run your approved method. And I don't know what Miss Bessie does. What do you do, Miss Bessie? Uh, yes, you want to make sure that, that chlorine is there. And if not, the way I tell the uh, customer, the customer is always important. You want to ensure that there's a residual there mm -hmm. to protect your customer. Right. So it's not that you're changing mm -hmm. your method, but most importantly, we need some residual in that line. So mm -hmm. you go flush, you go jack it up if you need to in order to get a residual and then continue taking your samples. Right, now that, that's illegal there, you cannot do that. What I'm talking about, if I have a customer that might be a quarter mile off of the main and I'm flushing it and I get a change in temperature, uh, I might not still be getting water from the main. And so what I want to do is keep testing it until I actually get the water from the main to show that I have the residual. Now, if I run it a half a day and I still don't have a residual, where do I go? I go to my alternate site, okay? You cannot flush your main. Remember this, if you flush your main, it's going to be more difficult to pass it because the turbidity in the main is going to rise and you're going to get a false sample or an unreadable sample because all of the sediment that's inside of the main is going to be what? Suspended, and then you're, you're only making it worse. But what I'm talking about is if you have a long service line and you think you're getting water from the main, but you're not, okay? That's why I like using my own test sites. All of my test sites are located right on the main. And if I don't have a residual there, there's something wrong with my technique, okay? I'm not chlorinating right. Or I have, I'm not flushing often enough in that main. Yeah, I'm glad Miss Bessie brought that up because you cannot flush the main or keep jacking up your chlorinator until you get a residual. That, that's circumventing the rule, okay? What I'm talking about is making sure the service line is clear of all the water that it might have been sitting there for a long time. Does that make sense? You can uh, pretty much determine just by the length of your service line and what tums you pull and how many minutes it's going to take you to clear that line. If yes. You pull directly from the distribution system. That's you true. Now, you say you have to report every reading you get. If I'm doing, I'll take, like, sometimes, so some of my places, I'll take four different chlorine beads. And I can see them because if it's, they'll, they'll start off low because they've been sitting for a while. Then as soon as they come up and stabilize, I know I'm, pull, I know I'm getting from the distribution system. Yes, uh, What's the state each, it depends on your state as to what they, they say. In Texas, we can't do that. Oh, yeah, we can't do so that. We have to use even the same sites week after week. We can't, like, you know, if I, if I get a low residual, I can't tell them I'm going to go to a different yeah. site. i got to use the same site every single week. And that is the site. Right, and that's, that's good. That's why 
I like using the color comparator and stuff like that until I get the good residuals because they're very ticklish over there. These people don't have anything better to do than to pounce on me, you know, so we go from there. Okay, and then uh, the one thing that they used to do, and this is prior to flushing and all that, is some people used to flame the faucet. Do y'all still flame, anybody flame the faucet using propane or butane burner or put alcohol or bleach on it? Used to use detention alcohol. Yeah, and it really it doesn't do any good. Uh, the AWWA did extensive study on this, and it would have to be immersed in alcohol for over an hour, and that is submerged. And if you're using bleach, it can even take longer. And here's the other thing that AWWA has recommended, is that when you open up a faucet wide open and let it run for a while, sometimes you have tuberculation on the inside of the line that breaks loose. So after you flush out the system and you're getting water from the main, turn it down for a period of time and allow the water to settle back down so that there won't be any tuberculation broke loose and getting into your samples. Does that make sense? Okay, so we look at from there. All right, so it, the AWWA does not recommend that anymore, that you put alcohol or chlorine bleach or whatever or even flaming the faucet. They recommend that you choose your sites wisely and you will not have any problems, but you never know, <laughs> you know, when you're talking about sample sites. Sometimes when you go up to, I mean, you have no choice. You, you, you know, you, you're trying to get something representative of an area in your distribution system. So, you, you know, you're lucky, like, you can get this place. Yes, sir. So, and then sometimes you go in, like, one, one night, you got a nice gooseneck faucet and everything, but Sometimes some people will go in there and wash out their um, lunch dishes. And I'll go in also and I'll see a little bit of tomato sauce mm. on the fixture. Well, obviously I'm going to clean it. Right, yeah. You know, that's where the bleach comes out. Right. You know, it good vigorous scrubbing with the bleach. And, yes, sir. You know, the swabs up and, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not an operator. I've never been to the sample. But I have a question. I've seen people take samples. Are you supposed to take the aerator off or leave it on? Uh, you're supposed to remove it because the aerator acts like a filter too, a screen, and little particles or tuberculation, colloidal particles of sand and things can get trapped in there, and they could get in your sample, but they do recommend taking off the uh, aerator, uh, that little screen off of the faucets. And if you do use outdoor faucets, if they have that vacuum air breaker on there, you know, a lot of people have to put those on the outside faucets now. Do not collect a sample from there. The possibility of getting a false positive is, uh, is greatly increased. They, act, they actually say that never collect a sample there. The, underneath that little diaphragm, bacteria can grow, and it's you just... Crawl up in there. Yes, sir. Insects. Yes, sir. And uh, so they recommend that you, if they have the vacuum breakers on there, do not. Uh, or air relief valve, then uh, do not collect the sample from that site. And uh, that's another problem because a lot of the new building codes and communities require that they put that on there. Do they require that in y'all's communities now, that they put those on there? And they got that little thing on there, and you tighten it and it breaks off. And you can't unscrew it. You know what I mean? The uh, plumbers nowadays have to screw that little, tighten in that little locking device down and break that thing off so that the customer can't remove it. But then I ask, what if that thing breaks? How do you get it off so you can put another one on there? But you know, what I think and what they think are two different things. Okay, and then you remember to, when you take your sample, you want a stream of water and never have the stream, you know, going in any other direction than straight down, okay? Straight down. And you want about a pencil size flow. Like I said, let it run for several more minutes after you flush the line. And that way the turbidity settles down. And then you take your cap off of your bottle. Slide it over, but do not turn the cap over. Things could get in it. And then put your sample bottle under there, fill it up to the neck but don't, don't overflow it. 
If it does overflow, throw the bottle away and start over. Okay, because you might have flushed out the sodium thiosulfate or it could accidentally give you a false positive again. Okay, then once you bring it back out, screw the tight cap down tightly and then you fill out your uh, form and you put down the time, the location, the chlorine residual and if it was a distribution system, you collected a distribution like this gentleman collects them at the well, at the raw water well, you'd put down what? Raw water if you're collecting it there at the well. And uh, if you're doing a special, a lot of times you might be disinfecting an area after repairs and stuff. And if you put distribution, it's going to be counted as what on your sampling? As one of your, okay? So you're going to mark it what? Construction or possibly even special. Yeah, routine other. And, and it just depends on your forms, okay? But anytime you market distribution, it will be figured into your monthly averaging. Uh, the, the laboratories are required to report that to the local agencies as one of your sample sites. You want to add anything to that, Ms. Bessie? I, got, okay. I have an instance come up where I have a positive. Actually, one of my wholesales, the wholesale booth, they had two positives. Yes, sir. And under the because on source water trigger monitoring, I had to sample every well that was running the day he took the samples twice. Mm -hmm. So I had I had three wells running that day, so I took two samples from each well. And I made the mistake of on the well, I put the same time to each sample because I took, took the samples at the exact, exact same time. Well, when the lab got those, they treated those two samples as one. Mm -hmm. So when I reported to the state, they said, you're in violation, you didn't, uh, you should have taken two samples. Well, I did. But the, 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 the lab said, Laboratory. Well, those the same, they had the same time. You got to make sure you put the different times so they can. That's right. Break down. Okay, so you have two separate samples from each well. That is how they had that been done. And the state knew it was a, it was a hypographical error, but the law is the law. Yeah, the law is the law. So, yeah. Yeah, so you have to put, so in the future, I have to put panel one, panel two. Yeah. And, and that's smart, you know, you, we learn from our errors because sometimes they're not intended to be, but they come back to bite us. Yeah, yeah. and the state know it, but they, you know, they have to follow protocol. Yes, sir. Very much so. Great. Okay. And so after that, we make sure we fill out the form correctly. And then I don't know what kind of chain of custody form y'all use. A lot of towns are different. Every town is different, every city is different. But in a lot of locations, they actually, once they tighten the lid, they put the chain of custody tag on the lid and the bottle. It actually, what, is an unbroken seal with their initials on there. And then they have a chain of custody form. The person who collected the sample fills out the chain of custody and then he takes it if he takes it back to his local lab, then those people check the bottles, make sure they're still sealed, got his proper tag on there, and then they sign for that system that they are now taking custody of that sample. And I don't know which each community, how y'all's community does chain of custody, but I can tell you this, it needs to be well written and documented because sometimes that's the only thing that'll keep you out of, out of trouble is to make sure the chain of custody. And I use this as an example. Uh, many, many years ago when O.J. Simpson went to trial, and a lot of people felt that he was guilty. But what happened, the chain of custody was broken. And the lab tech went and collected O.J.'s blood, and he wrote down that he collected 10 cc's of blood in both vials. And, but when it got to the laboratory, it was an 18-year-old kid that was the accepting the samples. There, he wrote down that when he got it, there were seven cc's and six cc's. And they put the detective on the stand and he said, oh, we, uh, they always write down 10 cc's. If you and I had done that, we would have been sitting next to Big Bubba for a hundred years, you know? But that's fraud, you know I mean? He, he wrote down what? Fraudulent information. So when it went to the jury, what? 
it, it nullified everything because there was no, I mean, it was inconsistent with the chain of custody. And that saved his life probably. That's a true story. And he, he got up on the stand and said, we always did that. If you and I would have done that, I mean, Big Bubba would have been wrapping his horns around you. <laughs> oh, you nice and tight, yeah. Yeah, if you work in our industry, you're going to go to jail. But if you're working in any other industry, you might walk away from it. You kill a fish, you go to jail for a million years. You kill a person, you go to jail for half a day. Yeah, so that's the way it goes sometimes. But uh, I always like to do, uh, you know, a thorough job on my chain of custody. So make sure you have a well-written. You want to add something to that, Miss Bessie? That's good. All right. And uh, uh, I hit the wrong button. Okay. Containers and samples uh, from designated sites, okay? Flush the service line, test for chlorine, flame or disinfect the faucet, which is optional now. Uh, the AWWA doesn't think it does much good, but if you still like doing it, there's no reason you can't, okay? And uh, collecting the sample, uh, fill sample container, complete sampling form, uh, send to the laboratory within 30 hours. Very important. And if you're carrying it inside of a cooler, make sure that you use laboratory ice or use regular ice. But some ice that you buy at your, like if you were to a sporting goods store, some of that ice will, has a lot of carbon dioxide in it and it'll migrate into your samples through that plastic bottle and it can cause havoc with your samples. So make sure you use laboratory ice or regular ice, okay? Uh, sterile container with sodium thiosulfate. It's 1.1 a, it's mil of 10% sodium thiosulfate is what's in there. And don't overfill container. Uh, state type of sample. And uh, we're gonna go into this next. And uh, uh, I think I'll do this on the board. Uh, I think it, I like doing things on the board because I think it works better, just personally. And I'm gonna, oh, thank you so much. You know, we don't get to work in teams very often. Normally we uh, go from eight to five, and for two and a, uh, two days and then a half a day unless we're doing technology and then we go all week and by the end of the week you can't talk anymore uh, in fact the students are happy you know I mean this guy's finally shutting up okay remember before we talked about sampling and if we have less than five sample sites we still have to have what five, five sites okay makes sense now if if I only collect one sample per month, okay, per month, one sample per month, I still have to have five sample sites, okay? Now let's talk about a positive, okay? Let's say that here's my house that I collected my sample from, and it comes back positive coliform. So now I'm gonna have to do my repeat sampling, okay, and I'm gonna give you two methods and it depends on your state as to how you collect these okay basically we're going to go five structures upstream and five structures downstream okay within five structures up and downstream and we're going to collect a sample at the original and then at each of these sites and some states require that you're going to collect a fourth somewhere in between here now in Texas, they've changed this a little bit. If this was a groundwater system, then we go to the raw water sample site and collect our fourth one, okay? You can still collect four samples, but you must collect one at your raw water because they wanna know why that sample became, would, came back positive, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Similar to what you're doing, okay? Right. Now, here's the thing. If I'm using more than one groundwater source, 
I still might only be collecting one sample per month, but let's say that I have two groundwater systems and they're both feeding into my system, I've got to collect wherever I have groundwater, wells, I've got to collect one raw water sample from each one of those sources. Now I have one town that has 1,500 connections, but they have seven small water systems or wells. And once upon a time, they collected a positive coliform. The operator only went to one of the groundwater wells and they got fined heavily because he didn't collect one at all of his well sites. Now, if you only have one well site, that's all you collect. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're gonna collect one at each one of your well sites. Makes sense? Okay. Now. If they all come back negative, that's good. Then the next month, I have to collect five samples. Okay? Does that make sense? So if I only collect one sample per month, but my, uh, my initial sample came back positive coliform, and then my repeat samples all came back negative, my raw water sample came back negative, then the next month I still have to collect five samples. All right? Now, let's say that I collect more than one sample. Let's say that I collect three samples per month and I'm still a groundwater system. Now, let's say that two of those samples came back positive coliform. Okay, at each one of those sites, I am going to collect, and this one came back positive coliform and this one. And so I'm going to go five structures up and downstream at each site, okay? At each site. And I'm going to collect repeat samples at my original site and then within five structures upstream and downstream, okay? I'm still less than what? Five samples. Let's say that all of them came back negative then uh, you know I do the same thing I'm gonna collect a sample here here and here 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 and here but I don't have to collect the fourth in between I'm gonna collect them at my raw water sources though each one because they want to know why did these samples come back positive okay make sense okay now if they come back negative, then the next month I'm going to collect five samples at my five uh, sites. And that's just to what? To make sure everything is operating correctly and efficiently. All right? All right, now, let's talk about positives and negatives. All right, if I'm collecting one sample site and my first sample comes back positive coliform, and then I do my repeat samples. And let's say that this one comes back negative. This one's negative, but my original site comes back positive coliform. What is that telling me about my sample site? Something's going on. Yeah, there could be something wrong. Maybe they got a, maybe you got a bad faucet. Maybe they're using it. Maybe something might be overhanging trees. Never know. Maybe it's too close to the ground. Nobody knows. But even though you still have to report it as a positive, you can request your government agency, your state agency, to change your monitoring plan and pick a new site because this is in the likelihood, if this one's positive and each house up and downstream is negative, is what? Then there's a good possibility there's something wrong taking place at that site. Okay, but you have to request it. You can't just do it. You can't just change a site on, arbitrarily on your own. You have to request permission, explain to them, well, we've gone over there and we determined that there's just too much overhang growth or something. And we'd like to change that site. And most likely they will allow you to do so. Okay, makes sense? Okay, now, let's go back to that site. If it 
comes back positive coliform, and one of my sites also comes back positive coliform. Is that a serious health concern? Not really. It's considered a possible health concern. Okay? It's, it's coliform group. Okay? It's positive coliform. So that's a possible health concern or risk. <clears throat> okay? So I've got to notify the public. Now here's what, it, in Texas, we have to notify the public <clears throat> by newspaper of local distribution by the next publication, but before 14 days, okay? Before 14 days is up. Make sense? Then we also have to hand deliver or mail an explanation of this to the public within 45 days, okay? Now let's look at it like this. If one of my sample, my initial sample came back fecal coliform, do I, do, do I wait to notify the public? No. <clears throat> if my first initial sample comes back fecal coliform, that is a serious health concern and we must notify the public by radio and television of local use within 24 hours and also uh, then put it in the paper and then also send out a letter. Okay? Make sense? So you have to do, notify the public within 24 hours. Now let's say that my first sample was positive coliform and one of my repeat samples came back fecal uh, positive. Uh, positive fecal. Then that again makes it a serious health concern or risk and I have to notify again the public within 24 hours. Yes, sir. Those automatic boil water. Anytime you have fecal, it's automatic boil. Yeah. But you will use your state agency's form when it comes to using the boil water notification. Whatever form they have adopted, uh, each state has their own methodology that they use. So you'll use their form as to reporting it to the public. And, uh, but don't hesitate to call and notify the state and the public as quickly as possible. Try to resolve this issue, what's causing it, as quickly as possible. Maybe a chlorinator accidentally shut down for a while. Something went wrong. Uh, could be virtually anything. But how did the fecal get in there is what we're worried about. Is where did that fecal come through? and how did it got into the system in the first place. Make sense? Okay. So, now, let's talk about some other types of violations. Okay, now, if I collect less than 40 samples, less than 40 samples, the MCL, maximum contaminant level, limit, okay? is I am allowed one positive sample, okay? So let's just say that I collect uh, one sample per month and it comes back, repeat positive coliform. How many violations do I have? One, but that's because I only collect one sample. But let's say the next month I collect my five samples and two of those samples come back positive coliform, confirmed. How many violations do I now have? Mm -mm. Three. I've got one for each positive plus I what? I bust the MCL. Maximum contaminant level only allowed me one. Now, if I collect greater than or equal to 40, I am allowed 5% positive samples, okay? So let's just say I collect 100 samples per month. And I have five samples that come back confirmed positive. How many violations do I have? 
Five. I mean, those are, those, you're not supposed to ever have positive, but that's five violations. Yep, but that's not, we're not talking about MCL now. This is five, okay, so 5%. Now, here's the thing. If I had a six sample that comes back confirmed positive, now how many violations do I have? Seven. Seven. The six plus I exceeded the 5%. Okay, now each state has requirements on reporting. Now, let's just say I accidentally forgot to call them within 24 hours. Now how many violations do I got? More. I've got more, don't I? You see how they can add up? So we have to be, what I say, due diligent. To give you an example, in my home state, Corpus Christi, about four years ago, had 80 samples came back fecal positive on their on their first samples. Their laboratory that they were using forgot to call the, the, the state agency and the EPA. Also, the local city didn't call. Now, here's the thing. I want to show you something. Here's the water plant right here. Right here is the TCEQ. The, this is the environmental TCEQ office. This is where all those positive samples were. How happy do you think those people were in that office? <laughs> they weren't too happy because all they had to do is walk across the street and notify them that there was a violation. And, but what happened in Corpus happens all the time. And this is a town of, of 300,000, 400,000 people. That's a lot of people, a lot of folks. Yet, they have some of the most advanced equipment. They have the most trained personnel. Yet, they still fail to do what? They, whoever was in charge was ill, and the second man in charge was on vacation. So nobody reported it, and that was serious because it was fecal. You know, and uh, luckily nobody got nobody got sick, uh, but it could have. But that happened in a major in a major city, as far as I was concerned. You know, uh, half a million people down there. So you know, uh, but I thought it was cute that the government enforcement agency was right next door. Did you remember about that? Yeah, yeah, ten four. All righty. So that's that. So. Violations can add up very quickly. So we need to what, be due diligent. We need to pay attention to what's going on. Make sure that you always use your best operators to collect samples. Uh, make sure they're clean. They, prop, they use proper hygiene. Uh, wash their hands and, uh, and everything else. I have been in cities where they require them to even put gloves on. Latex or nitrile gloves. And some towns, I went to one town, it's down at Webster by NASA, where they have the rockets, and everybody at NASA has to wear the mask and gloves, and they have to put on an apron. Now that's at NASA. Now is that going a little overboard? I think it is, but I guess you could say the likelihood of getting a false positive is greatly reduced. The amount of risk really goes down, so you look at it from that standpoint. Any questions? Boy, time flies when you have the flow. All right. If you look on page 1610, let me go through this right quick. Okay. Uh, hit the wrong button. One sample within five connections up and downstream. Collect samples the same day. That's very important. Okay. Uh, one sampling point. Okay. Sample on four consecutive days or from same tap on the same day. Uh, I'm a firm believer if I'm going to, if I only collect one sample, that I'm going to collect all my samples on the same day. That's just my belief. Uh, but you do whatever your standard operating procedure is for your, your particular system. Okay. Invalidating positive samples removed from record. 
if repeat samples are negative, system of explained sample is not representative, okay? Uh, that's hard to do though. Uh, I guarantee you, uh, once you have your monitoring plan approved, and then you come back later on and you try to say that the sample site is not representative, they're gonna be wondering why haven't you altered that monitoring plan well before that ever occurred. And it does happen, but again, due diligence, okay? Contact uh, regional office for instructions. Uh, where's y'all's regional office for y'all's uh, systems down here? You know? You know? 10-4, okay. Uh, samples not validated used for coliform MCL and uh, monitoring requirements, required routine samples not submitted. Uh, you wouldn't believe how often that does happen. I've seen that happen more often than you think. Uh, oh, Joe's supposed to be collecting samples and he got sick and so no one, when you talk about setting up a chain of, of responsibility. Whenever the people that are not able to perform their task, then you need what? A backup plan. Somebody who is going to act on their behalf. So we always had it like we had the head guy that was going to be responsible. If he's not going to be there, it's his responsibility to notify the person who is replacing him to make sure that he understands that he is responsible for collecting those samples. So you have to have some responsibility, but if you're sick or you're on vacation or something comes up, at, you know, that maybe a child gets sick or something like that, or, or you had a flat tire getting to work or whatever. So make sure you have a follow-up plan, okay? And anything greater than 40 samples, 5%. Uh, less than, you can have up to one positive. Acute risk violation and uh, public notification. Procedures decided by primary agency, and I like that, okay? Always consult agency before notifying the public, and that's in Texas, that would be the TCQ. And who is y'all's agency here that y'all would respond to? Department of Health? Yes, sir. Uh, acute violations. Again, acute means there's the possibility that it could cause death, okay? Could cause, you, uh, within 24 hours using serious health concern. I have seen it written on exams, serious health risk. Risk also. And uh, non-acute violations, uh, possible health concern or risk. And uh, again, it, within 14 days within the newspaper and all that, yes? On that non-acute violation, if you're looking at EPA, because VEX text is there, EPA allows up to 30 days yes. uh, for that type of um, notification there. So I'm not sure if your state agency is more strict like Texas or if you've just adopted EPA, which is 30 day notification. Yes. And. Uh, Special because in the event of low pressure distribution, this is when you might have to issue a boil water notice. Okay, in the event of low distribution, low during normal operation, the EPA recommends that pressure should never be fall below 35. During emergencies, they recommend that it should never fall below 20 psi. Okay, so. In the event of low distribution pressures, that might be more, you know, it might be happening more often than what it should. It's going to happen, you can't help it. You know, you're gonna have to, if you're making repairs, you're gonna have to isolate systems. And you're, you could be lowering the pressures in different parts of the city, okay? And uh, water outages, you know, water main breaks, uh, things like that that occur. Repeated unacceptable back tea samples. Uh, even though you might not be having confirmed positives, but let's say you have several incidences where you've had possible health concerns, 
they might say there's something taking place in the distribution that we need to make sure that your water is safe and they might request that you do a boil water notice to the public, okay? Failure to maintain adequate chlorine residuals. A lot of times that's very difficult, especially where you have old deteriorating lines or you have low density population with large distribution systems. Uh, determine necessary action and all of those are part of it. Ball water notices and next thing we'll do is chlorination, disinfected purposes and all this. But if you look over on page 1610, this is the flow chart for determining what to do. Okay, and if you look at the start, and let's say I had a water main break, okay? And I had to make repairs. And you ask these questions. Did distribution pressure drop below 20 PSI during the maintenance, repair, and emergency incident? And you answer yes or no. If you say yes, it did. You follow that direction. Was the distribution line fully or partially dewatered? You answer again, yes or no. Let's say yes. Can the affected distribution lines be disinfected in accordance with AWWA standards? Okay? And <coughs> again, you would ask yes and no. If you said no, then immediately issue a boil water notice or notification to, a, to affected area in accordance with your state agency's uh, uh, requirements for that are the EPAs, okay? And, uh, but if you said yes, then you uh, uh, keep on following down. Can the affected distribution lines be adequately flushed? And you say yes or no. And if you say yes, flush until the chlorine residual reaches normal operating levels are until a minimum of two volumes of the affected line is flushed, whichever is greater. If the water is not clear after prescribed flushing, continue to flush until water clears. Okay, so you follow the schematics. Now in the middle, some states require different standards for repairs. In Texas, we do. If it's a new line, we follow AWWA standards. But in Texas, we have to worry about Giardia because it's in the soil. And so Texas prescribes under emergency conditions that we can disinfect with 500 milligrams per liter for 30 minutes. Then we can flush the line and put it back into service. Or we can flush or chlorinate with 50 milligrams per liter for 24 hours and then put the line back into service. And then we have to collect a back T sample one every thousand feet. Uh, the AWWA is different. AWWA requires different dosages for different lengths of time. But then they require two back T samples taken on two consecutive days until they're all come back negative. And uh, uh, it's more uh, back T oriented than it is chlorine residual or, or application of chlorine. But in, you know, in some instances, we don't have that time to do all that. So we super chlorinate with the 500 milligrams per liter for 30 minutes, flush the line, dechlor it. That, and, at that level, does the state require you to dechlor? Yeah, oh yes, you have to dechlor even at 50. Yeah, uh, if you put that out there, the people would be coming after you with their rifles and shotguns and pistols, and you'd be running up the street trying to hide from them because once they get that stuff all over. Uh, what, do you, what do they do for the 24 hours when you can't put the line back into service? Well, that's why we go with the 30 minutes. Okay. But if it's if you can go 24 hours, like it might be an area where there's you know, uh, something where you could do that, yeah. But most of the time you, you do the 30 minute program. Yeah, I, like I was telling you, if you put that super chlorinated water out in the bar ditch 
or down in your storm drains and it kills a fish, Big Bubba's waiting for us. Yeah, big EPA guy's going to come and grab you up and take you over there. And this guy hadn't seen a human being in 50 years. Yeah, and I always tell people that. See, I, I teach in the prisons. And uh, sometimes I wonder why I ever did that. In fact, I'm in prison next week. Uh, I go to Rocheron. And that's where hardened criminals, murderers are. But you know, they're really good students. The reason is, if they stay good, they get to work in the water and the sewer plants, and they don't have to stay inside the prison. They live at the sites. So it behooves them to behave. And some of them people scare the dogs out of me. You know, not too many people scare me. But have you ever walked into prison? I won't tell you what it's like, but uh, it's bad. But follow your state's recommendations when it comes to chlorination and uh, uh, disinfecting your mains and how. What system do y'all use here? Do y'all follow AWWA or do y'all have a prescribed method? State, state recommended. State recommended? That's on a case by case thing, you Case by case? Yeah. 10 and 4. With our, we have a new service line put in and we follow the AWWA. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, 10 4. That's great. You want to add to that, Miss Bessie? All right. Uh, chlorination, disinfectant purposes, and this, let's look at this real quick, okay? Stored water must have disinfectant residual. Okay. We talked about, have y'all talked about CT in the past? Uh, any of y'all familiar with concentration and time? And it's based on the pH of the water and the temperature. The residual and, uh, and, uh, and time element, okay? The EPA has come up with numbers that we have to meet, okay? So look at it like this. If I have a storage tank, then I have, let's say, I have five hours of contact time with the chlorine. But I go and look on the CT chart, say for uh, viruses, and it says that I have to have a minimum of four and a half hours at that concentration and that water temperature and that pH. Am I meeting the CT value for that system? Yes or no? I have to have a minimum of five hours. I mean four and a half hours but my, my CT value in my storage tank is five hours. So am I meeting that? Yes, but vice versa. Let's say that my, my storage is four hours and my CT value comes up to four and a half hours. Do I meet the CT value? No. What is the only thing that I can do? Can I change the size and capacity of that ground storage tank or that clear well? No. But what can I change? You can change the withdrawal rate on that tank or you can change your dosage. There you go. Dosage. The only thing that I can reasonably do to meet that CT value is to increase my strength or my dosage until the CT value is less than my detention time, okay? Does that make sense? All right. And uh, you want to add something to that, Miss Bessie? Uh, pretty good. All right. So, must be present in the drinking water. And in Texas, it's, if we're talking about free chlorine, it's 0.2. If we're talking about chlorination or monochloramines, it's 0.5, or what we call sometimes total chlorine. And uh, do y'all have a minimum residuals here in, in y'all's area? Like 0 0.2, 0 0.5 or anything, that, something like that? Yeah, 10 4. Okay. And controls taste and odor. Here's the thing. Monochloramines, if I'm using ammonia, if I continue to add more chlorine, I'm going to create dye and trichloramines. They cause what? Taste and odor problems. 
I like monochloramines because there is no taste and odor. Okay? So if I continue to add chlorine to my monochloramines, it's going to convert it to dye and try. Okay, now vice versa. Let's say that I'm using free chlorine and I add it into the distribution system. And let's say that I got a zoological growth in the distribution system and I have organic materials in there. What is that free chlorine going to do? It's going to oxidize it and I'm going to start creating amine, ammonia, and ammonia. And the chlorine is going to combine with that ammonia and I'm going to produce what? Well, not yet. I hadn't got there yet. <laughs> We're working that way. But I'm going to create mono, di, and trichloramine. I'm going to create di, uh, what? Again, taste and odor problems. But if I have too much ammonia, if I've got a lot of zoological growth in there, and I've got a lot of ammonia, that's when I'm really going to have problems. I'm going to create what? Nitrates. I'm going to, I'm going to have Simodius and Nitrobacter bacteria and they're going to convert that ammonia into nitrite and nitrates, which can cause what? Blue babies, uh, methemoglemia. And then we got some more problems. So distribution system, to me, the distribution system operator has more responsibility than any plant operator. Because the plant operator, all he has to do is get it treated to a degree of high quality. But once it goes into the distribution system, Anything and everything can happen. Does that make sense? All right. Just because of the zoogleal growth or the type of disinfectant that we're using. Okay? And again, if I'm using monochloramines and I put it out into a system where there's a lot of ammonia, then the nitrosomus and nitrobacter bacteria are going to convert it into nitrites and nitrates, which will cause the blue babies or more ammonia. If I produce ammonia, when ammonia gets into, the, into a child's blood, it's looking for oxygen. In your blood, 5% of the blood is nitrosomus and nitrobacter bacteria in the blood itself. So what does it do? It steals the oxygen from the red blood cell and uses it to make the nitrite and then the nitrates. Once that starts, that baby is dead. You cannot reverse it. You're going to a funeral. And uh, that is a fact of it. And uh, how many of y'all use chlorine dioxide? Anybody use chlorine dioxide in here? Got to be real careful with chlorine dioxide. Chlorine, chlorine dioxide is a very strong oxidant. It's two and a half times faster than free chlorine, hyperchlorous acid. But here's the thing. When you overdose, you create the chloride ion. And the chloride ion does the same thing as ammonia. It steals oxygen. And it's going to t convert the chlorite back to a chlorate. Okay? And you get symptoms of methemoglemia. The bad thing about it is if you're a hemophiliac, anemic, or if you've got sickle cell, it'll kill you in a heartbeat. Because in sickle cell, that abnormal gene, it causes it to become active. And it brings it out of dormancy. Okay? And so it's very dangerous. We have to be very careful when using chlorine dioxide. And uh, so we control taste and odor, oxidation of iron, manganese, and hydrogen sulfides, gases, we talk about gases and such in there, methanes and stuff like this. Uh, disinfection after repairs, very important. We normally used uh, either HDH or bleach when we uh, disinfected after repairs. Uh, what do y'all prefer, the bleach or the H? Whatever. I prefer the store. Yeah, by yeah. Wally Mart or something like that. Yeah, ten four. Okay, and chlorine sources, hypochlorites. Uh, you know, normally it can be either sodium, uh, liquid bleach, or calcium. Uh, normally it's granular. Uh, on exams, this is one of those plural or singular exams questions. They'll ask you what forms can HTH or calcium hypochlorite chloride come in. 
And if they put on the exam that it can be found in powder, it can be found in tablet, solid, or granular, or all of the above, the most correct answer would be all of the above. But if you have on your exam that what is the normal form for HGH, 85% all of HGH in the U.S. is granular, okay? So the most correct answer would be what? Granular form. So you have to be careful when you're reading those sneaky questions. And they like to be sneaky. I don't know why, but they are, okay? And then pure chlorine produced by electrolysis of brine. You run electrical currents and the ions separate and we produce the, the chlorine and uh, in common table salts, it's in the body and all that good stuff. And here you can see a little, what we call a uh, plunger pump or a uh, piston type pump, uh, works quite well. And uh, a lot of people are using peristolic pumps. Uh, peristolic pumps are gaining popularity over the yes. plunger or piston, yeah. Uh, the only thing you can do with those is increase the speed of the rotor and that's about it, but it really works good. Uh, liquid bleach uh, weighs 8.34 pounds. Uh, let me clarify that. That's not exactly true. When you talk about 6% bleach, 6% bleach weighs 1.016 pounds. It weighs more than water. And when you get up to 12.5% bleach, it's 1.2% of one, the specific gravity is 1.2. Whenever you use bleach, it is required that you keep the MSDS sheet with it at all times. So you need the material safety data or data sheet with it at all times. How many of y'all use bleach? Good. And you must have that MSDS, okay? You must also have a hydrometer. A hydrometer is going to check the specific gravity of that bleach. And that way you can test it. Now, like the hydrometer that I use, I have to put the bleach in the ice box and chill it down to 60 degrees. When my temperature reaches 60 degrees, then I check the specific gravity because that's just the way my hydrometer works. So you need to know how your hydrometer works. You can use the plumb and bobbit, which is more accurate. Uh, have you ever used the plumb and bobbit? No. Yeah. Uh, it's very expensive piece of apparatus. A hydrometer is just a glass tube with some lead in the bottom of it, and it's equal to one atmosphere of water. Okay, one atmosphere of water. So that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, not liquid chlorine. It's called liquid bleach or it's called a solution, and it's made up of a solute and a standard. The solute being the chlorine, and the uh, solution, or the solute and the solution, being uh, what? The water, whatever it's blended in, and stuff like that, so. Uh, smaller, large systems use them quite often. Uh, city of Houston, our largest city in Texas, uses nothing but bleach. They make it on site. Uh, the reason is, their water plant is downtown Houston. And if they had a major chlorine leak, they'd watch out and what? It might do Texas some good. We clean out Houston, we could start over. No. But uh, they're real concerned about the downwind contaminant because if it did, they used to use railroad cars. And, uh, you know, if one did happen to leak, it could cause major death. So they went to bleach. Uh, that way they could be more safe, okay? And it must be NSF approved. All bleach and all HTH must be NSF approved and uh, stuff like that. All right. That's a blank screen. What does that mean, Miss Bessie? <laughs> I was just checking. Okay. Calcium hypochlorite made by reacting chlorine with lye. All right. Comes in granular and powder form, the most common is granular. Uh, normally, it's 65% active. Uh, I have seen it anywhere from 62 up to 78% now. 
Um, a lot of people have switched over to that 75% material, but it costs more per pound. Uh, you have to look at how much benefit you're getting by the additional percent active ingredient. And uh, it, uh, a powerful oxidizer, very explosive if it comes in contact with organic materials, uh, flammable with organic materials, uh, spontaneous combustion. And uh, now chlorine, okay, pure chlorine as uh, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, Hydroxide, hydrogen gas are byproducts of the process. Now, chlorine is only found pure in one area, and that's coming out of volcanoes. Volcanoes produce pure chlorine. When you look at that greenish yellow color coming out of the volcanoes, that is pure chlorine. Okay, pure chlorine. So you can see it in its pure form there. Okay, becomes amber colored when when cooled, and uh, amber is a Greek word that, uh, uh, how do you say, means reddish yellow, okay? Amber, reddish yellow. Uh, chlorine gas is very toxic and commonly shipped in 150 pound cylinders or ton cylinders. A lot of towns uh, have shipped it away <laughs> from chlorine due to its uh, its toxicity and the locations within their communities. It's really, liability. yeah, liability and that downwind evacuation plan and I emergency remember, response. I remember using those cylinders every once in a while. You get you got one that was real stiff and you have to put the old mold onto it. Oh like, yeah. Oh man, is this thing gonna this thing gonna snap off? Or, yeah. That yeah, wasn't fun. Yeah. Uh, vacuum withdrawal, uh, one pound per day per degree. Of Fahrenheit, so if your average temperature is 70 degrees, you could draw off what? 70 pounds. Okay, uh, ton cylinders are eight pounds per day per degree Fahrenheit, so if it was average temperature, eight times 70 would be what? 560 pounds of chlorine that you could draw for that day. Pressure transmission, 150. Uh, pressure transmission, OSHA no longer accepts pressurized systems. Some systems still exist though. But look at the difference. 150 under pressure is only 42 pounds per day at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Ton containers is 336 pounds per day at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're using a 150 cylinder at one pound under vacuum, you can go as high as 70, okay? Now, what happens when you exceed that amount? Remember, the velocity of chlorine gas increases. As velocity increases, it loses its heat and it converts back to liquid chlorine, causing you to form chlorine ice. Thusly, your system will freeze up. Does that make sense? Just remember, as velocity increases, the amount of heat is given up to a fact that it converts back to liquid chlorine. And when it converts back to li liquid chlorine, it will create what? Chlorine ice, liquid ice almost. So we go from there, okay? And uh, hypochlorination, this goes back to our HTH and our, our uh, bleach. Uh, take HGH, you blend it in water, stir it up real good with a mixer, and then we draw, draw off the supernatant and the remaining lime seeps to the bottom of the, of the tub and we can draw it off, okay? And uh, uh, remember this, that your chlorinators must be able to put out 50% greater than your maximum dosage. So if your maximum dosage is 100 pounds per day, your chlorinator would need to be able to put out what? 150, right? Okay, very good. Uh, you need a good mixing tank, water, sodium, or calcium hypochlorite, and uh, meter paste or manually controlled pump. We have what we call volumetric and gravimetric. Volumetric ignores weight, okay? Volumetric only looks at volume. Gravimetric 
is weight. We're subtracting weight, okay? And so that's what we look at, all right? Solution strength adjust chemical amounts. And uh, like if I was switching from say HEB brand or uh, Walmart brand uh, uh, bleach of 6% and I was going to a commercial bleach of 12% or 12.5% or even 15, I would have to make what? Yeah, make adjustments to compensate for the different strengths of that material based on its specific gravity, okay? And stuff like that. Usually used by very small systems, and I, I think a lot of large systems are going to them now. Uh, gas chlorination, glass enters through an inlet valve. What it is, when it works on vacuum, what happens on the service side? I've got it tied into the distribution system. Let's say that the pressure in my distribution system is 60 PSI. Well, to create a vacuum, I'm gonna have to have a pump over here. That pump needs to be at least twice that of the distribution. So my, dis my service pump is gonna have to be what? Say 120 PSI. So what happens as it passes through the injector it creates a vacuum because what happens, the valve remains, what? Closed until I create the vacuum. What happens, you know, when pressure is static, okay, let's say that I have a distribution line here and the water's not moving. So let's say I read 60 PSI, okay? Now, when the water starts to move in this pipe, what happens to the pressure in the gauge? Drops, okay? So I've got my chlorinator over here. I've got my injector right here. And so I'm gonna be feeding through my chlorine source. I'm gonna have a pump over here and I'm gonna have water coming into here. And I'm gonna create a vacuum across this system that will allow the ambient pressure to open that valve and allow chlorine to come in and mix in the distribution system. Once this pressure goes back to zero, then the valve would automatically do what? Close, okay? So vacuum is much safer than, than pressurized system, if that makes sense, okay? And uh, through the, uh, powered by water, we just talked about that, we have to have a pump that can at least be twice that of the pressure in the distribution system. All right. Gas meter through a rotor meter. A rotor meter, if you look on there, it operates off of a needle valve. What did I do up here, that thing over here? Yeah, there it is. Okay. All right, we have a rotor meter, and basically it's a glass tube, and in here is a ball down here, and this thing is tapered slightly, okay? It's tapered, and uh, so when you're looking down the top of the tube, you'll notice the inside and you'll see the ball. So here, let's say the ball's right here. You always went read off of the what? The center line of the ball. So, because right here is where the gas is passing. So let's say this is 50 pounds per day, okay? So I'm reading the area around. Now, if I wanna feed a little less, then the area around the ball decreases, okay? But that's all done by a needle valve up here that's hooked onto a, say to a four to 20 milliamp signal, four being, wide open, 20 meaning what? Completely full, okay? So as volume slows down through the system, this ball is automatically going to compensate for the flow. But as flow increases, the four to 20 milliamps can pick that up and that ball could rise to the new rate. Does that make sense? Okay, hopefully it does. All right, all right. 
All right. Enters flow controller and suction into the injector. Uh, mixed with water, then applied. Okay. Does chlorine really like water? No. It really doesn't. But as you can see how this system works, you got your injector. When you create the vacuum, the valve opens. You can see the, the, the needle valve, the needle valve right up here. And you can see the ball within the rotometer and the rate indicator. And quite simple, but works quite well. And as the water velocity increases through the throat, what happens to the vacuum? Vacuum. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're over there. All righty. Dosage demand. Dosage equal to the chemical applied milligrams per liter or parts per million. Demand is that that is used up. And residual is that that's remaining after everything has been what? Oxidized. And so it works real quick. Dosage equals demand plus the residual. And type of residuals, we have free chlorine, chemically uncombined. Then we have combined residual, and, uh, which is the monochloramines and di and tri. But we want mono, but we do not want what? Di and tri. Chemically combined, total residual, free residual, and combined residual, um, which is basically true. Okay. Residuals, minimum residual requirements. In Texas, again, it's 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. Uh, 0 0.2 for free, 0 0.5 for total or combined. Maximum residual in Texas is 4.0 milligrams per liter on a running annual yearly average, okay? So as long as our yearly average is 4.0 or less, then we meet that requirement. Do y'all have a maximum requirement here in y'all's state? Anybody? Of course, of course. That's the EPA, right? Yes. Yes. But the state could be different. Right, right, yeah. right. States, each state has a lot of leeway. Yeah. Yeah, and that's good. I think states, Texas is a primacy state. Meaning, we follow the EPA laws, but we administer the law. The Texas administers that law. And how do y'all do it here? Are y'all primacy state here? Where y'all administer the law by the state officials? Yeah, that's the best way. Uh, many years ago when I first got in this beast, we used to have two inspections. One by the EPA and then one by the state. And they never agreed on anything. So now we have one inspection and it's done by the state, but they make sure that we're following all the EPA requirements. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, testing for chlorine residual and uh, DPD, NN, diethyl p diamine. Uh, DPD is, is a chemical that when re reacted with chlorine will turn a pinkish reddish color and uh, works quite well. The only bad thing about DPD, it also reacts with manganese. Do y'all have to do manganese correction here? Yeah, it also turns pink to a reddish color. So if you have a lot of manganese in there, you might have to run the manganese test to see how much is actually there. And uh, uh, measures the chlorine residual, turns water from pink to a reddish color and uh, measured with a color comparator and uh, forms two types of acids, hypochlorous and also hydrochloric, and which is also known as muriatic. I've seen that on test before. Have you seen that on test, muriatic acid? Disinfecting power is uh, reduced, destroyed by reducing agents. And then after all of that's taken place, we get a free chlorine residual. And, uh, uh, Right here in the first stage, right in this area, this is inorganic. So when we first start, start adding chlorine, all of the demand right here is inorganic or gases. It could be methane, it could be H2S, it could be some kind of metal salts. All of those things that are in here are oxidized first, okay? Now in the second phase, we have the destruction of chlorine by compounds. Uh, let me go ahead and put this in here. 
Okay, stage two. Now what here, there's organic material in here. This organic material starts to break down and it forms amine, ammonia, and ammonium. The chlorine, as we continue to add chlorine, this ammonia combines with that chlorine and we have the formation of chloramines, okay? So right in this phase, we're, we're forming chloramines, okay? Making chloramines. And then the chloroorganics and chloramines, that's up to that point. And then we go into stage three, okay? And this is the destruction of the chloramines. Right here, we're at the peak of monochloramine. Now what happens is I continue to add more chlorine, I'm going to destroy the monochloramines. And I'm going to start creating dichloramine. And then after I can destroy dichloramine, I'm going to make trichloramine. Okay? Now, once I get to this point right here, I have destroyed all of the chloramines. Okay? And uh, the last phase, stage four, is chlor free chlorine residual. Now, you'll notice that it never comes back to zero. Right here is free chlorine. If you drew a line straight across, this is free chlorine. Down here is organic precursors known as how do you, organic acids, humic and fulvic acid. This is humic and fulvic acid. And right here is the breakpoint chlorination, okay? Now, everything up to this point is known as chlorine reducing agents. That point right there known as demand. This is from here to there is demand. Once we get past break point, we go into residual. And depending on how far past this is going to determine our chlorine residual. All right? So you're going to have reduction of chlorine by compounds such as what? Gases and uh, organic salts. I mean, not organic salts, but uh, metal salts, then we have the chloroorganics, we have the destruction of the chloramines, and then we end up with free chlorine and break point. Uh, I'm going to go back one place though. Right here, I wish we had a line right there, humic and fulvic acid. When the chlorine, the free chlorine starts to combine with the, with the humic and fulvic acid is when we start making monochloromethane, dichloromethane, and then trichloromethane, which are shown to cause cancer, okay? So the more free chlorine we have, the more tr possibility of creating TTHMs, okay? Trihelomethanes. And, uh, but if you, if you were operating a groundwater system, test question, which two Stages do not exist in groundwater that does not have any organic matter in it. If you don't have organics, can I create this? No. So in a groundwater system that has no organic material, I go straight from one to where? I go to four, yeah. I go straight to four. I skip two and three. And uh, that's, in some cases that happens. You, you know what was interesting? Delaware, we were uh, in Delaware a week or so ago. In their groundwater system, they have so much organic matter, and I don't know if you all have the same issues here. It's almost like a surface water where they had these precursors and disinfection byproducts that were tremendous amount that, you know, they're having to do the additional treatment on groundwater. Oh. You all have the same here? No, they, they must be under the direct influence of surface water. Well, yeah. no, this is what I was told uh, is because it's a swamp area oh. and where you had, you know, just years and years of the trees and leaves and other detritus literally being buried down into their groundwater source. Yep. It's almost naturally occurred. Mm. And I thought that was quite interesting yeah. because I've never run into that before. Yeah. They, the only places in Texas where that's a big problem is 95% of Texas is nothing but a gigantic fault line. And you have all of these spiders and cracks in the ground in the impervious material, and that's where the organics get down into it. Uh, 
I'd say only about 5% of Texas is really truly groundwater. The rest of it is under organic influence, yeah. So, yeah, it's bad. Okay. Chlorine safety, chlorinated rooms and equipment, as you remember. Uh, disinfection equipment, 50% greater than your highest dosage. House above ground, if you're below ground, chlorine is heavier than air, hard to get out of. Okay, equipment and containers stored separately. Uh, if you have a building, the wall between the chlorinator equipment and the chlorinator uh, cylinders must be impermeable. Impermeable wall and all of your piping that passes through it must be sealed to prevent gases from leaking through the, through the passing of the piping, okay? Uh, high level and floor level screen vents. If you only have like one 150 hook directly to your chlorinator, all you have to have is a floor vent and an elevated vent. I like doors with the vent built into the door. That way if I walk up to the door, if, I, if there's a chlorine leak, I can smell it, okay? And you should always be aware that there's something toxic in there. Okay, uh, if you have more than uh, more than one cylinder hooked to a manifold, then you have to have forced air ventilation through the top. It blows air into the room where it'll purge it out through the bottom vent, okay? Uh, forced air vents in 150 pound cylinder rooms. Uh, again, safety, uh, uh, the rooms and the equipment. Store chlorine between 50 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, the fusible plug is made out of lead. It can be cast in or screwed in. Designed to melt at 160. The temperature is really 157 to 162 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Scales available because remember the rotor meter varies throughout the day. So I'm going to take a, a scale reading in the morning and then the next morning I can determine how many pounds of actual chlorine that I used. Uh, hypochlorination solution equipment locked. Uh, in today's rule, the Safe Drinking Water Act requires us now to be aware of terrorists. And so everything has to be locked down uh, to prevent terrorists from stealing cylinders and everything else. Uh, solution containers must be covered. Uh, uh, chemical risk management, the EPA requires that any private municipal or industry, anytime you handle more than 2,500 2, pounds, or more, you must have an emergency response uh, plan, how to do, handle that uh, disaster if it does occur. Uh, detecting using 10% uh, ammonium hydroxide, what it is, it's a little squirt bottle, like you just put uh, ketchup in, and you put a, a little bit in the bottom of the bottle, and you squeeze the vapors up around the chlorine, and you'll get a white smoke or a white cloud indicating that you have a chlorine leak. So the 2,500 pounds, that's, that's in, as in chlorine gas, right? Yes, yes. 2,500 pounds, which think of it, one ton cylinder is what? 2,000, so if you have two ton cylinders, you will have a plan put together, yes. Take precautions before entering a chlorine room. Anytime you enter a chlorine room, you must have a mouthpiece respirator and nose clamp that's designed for chlorine, and you must have an air uh, testing device that will check for chlorine if you're going into a chlorinated room anytime. Uh, and also, if you're changing out cylinders or if you're gonna be making equipment changes, you must have two people, yeah. And both must be trained in the use of a self-contained breathing apparatus and all that stuff. Uh, also, it's good to have a phone nearby where you can contact your supplier. They normally know how to handle leaks and stuff like better than most people, okay? And you can see this gentleman putting on the SCBA uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, hooking up a chlorinator, and the other guy standing there uh, as a backup, you know, uh, your responder, emergency responder. Be trained and be prepared. Wear a fresh air supply, supplied air uh, system. Uh, have a standby help. Have repair equipment, uh, either type A or B, or even C uh, repair equipment. Wear safety harness and lifeline. 
if you do collapse, they have the ability to pull you out of there uh, without having to enter themselves, all that good stuff. First age, if the person is succumbed to chlorine, move them to fresh, warm air, and sit or lie down. A lot of times if you elevate the trunk, the gas being heavier than air will help uh, or will be removed from your lungs. If the person is unconscious, you know, do your ABCs and also elevate the body, assuming that he's got chlorine in his lungs, okay? Uh, call medical help. Wash skin, clothing, and safety shower. Eye washes, remember, for a minimum 15 minutes or longer. All of that stuff is necessary. Uh, drinking coffee, tea, milk, or peppermint. Peppermint, if you ever have acid indigestion, anybody get acid reflux? That works wonderful, right? Get you a big old piece of peppermint. It'll knock it right out, okay? Uh, artificial respiration, if necessary. Remember your ABCs. Has everybody been trained in, in first aid and CPR? Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, great. And uh, alternative disinfectants. Again, in Texas right now, for terminal disinfection, all we can use is chlorine. But for pretreatment, we use ozone and also UV. Uh, at one of the water plants that I worked at, we had a lot of problems with geosmin and also MIB. And so we used ozone, oops, we used ozone to control geosmin. And uh, what it does when the, when the uh, algae dies, it creates a, a a, uh, not a cyst, but a, a spore full of oil. And whenever the wheels come around on your conventional mixing, it breaks open that oil and the people will come after you. You guarantee you want to leave town. That is the nastiest stuff. It'll kill you too. It'll kill you. Uh, I really like UV as a, as a treatment. After the water has been treated, and before we chlorinate, you cannot do this before chlorination, but if you use UV, ultraviolet light, it does a wonderful job of either killing or sterilizing the little critters. And by the time you get to disinfection, it does quite well. Uh, anybody ever use UV in here? Anybody? Okay. It's something's fairly new. Chlor Oh, yeah. Yeah, they didn't have much there. <laughs> yes, sir. 10 4. Uh, chlorine gas or chlorine dioxide, again, is yellow, greenish gas, chlorine odor. We're getting close to lunchtime. Effective against taste, odor, color, iron, manganese. Uh, produces chlorites. This one is the most dangerous. Remember, chlorites, if you're hemophiliac, anemic, or if you have sickle cell, can kill. The MCL. The MCL for chlorides is 1.0 milligrams per liter. For chlorine dioxide is 0.8 milligrams per liter. So we have to be aware of those, okay? Uh, that's for chlorine dioxide right there, 0.8 milligrams per liter. Applicable for pretreatment. It's really good for iron, manganese. Uh, it's real good at removing taste and odor and if you have trouble with trihalomethanes or haleacidic acid, it literally just destroys it. So you're in good shape. Uh, high cost, difficult to measure. It normally produces a blue, bluish color residual, but it only lasts a very short period of time. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about ozone. I'm sorry, I was in a different place. Uh, faint blue gas, three oxygen atoms. What happens, you run pure oxygen through a Ionizer, the ionizer converts it into two individual oxygen ions, and then it passes through pure oxygen, making O3. But it's so volatile, it only lasts a few minutes. And it, you talk about CO2, that stuff will kill you. You better know what you're doing with ozone, too. I mean, you have to be on top of yourself. 
Uh, most powerful chemical oxidizer, biocide. Very good biocide. Superior oxidation for taste, odor, and color. Most expensive chemical disinfectant. Can produce aldehydes. Uh, if you have bromide or bromine in the water, when the bromine mixes with the ozone, it makes the aldehydes, which can be just as bad as anything else that you can drink. Not proof for final disinfection. Ultraviolet light, effective as biocide. Low doses kills bacteria, viruses, and cryptosporidium. Uh, and actionality, it doesn't kill unless it gets so close to the light. But you have the DNA and the RNA. The communicator between the two is pepsids, okay? And if you destroy the RNA, it cannot go into the DNA, which is the library, and pull out the tools or the parts it needs to reconstruct. So you design, destroy that and it cannot reproduce. And it works quite well. Uh, produces no disinfection byproducts. Uh, produces no residuals. And that's the end. Now, folks, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Bessie because she's taking over this afternoon. <laughs>